Hola, buenas tardes. Bienvenidos a todos. Muchas gracias por venir. Bueno, vamos a hacer la presentación de eh, Rey Yupi, que es nuestra artista en residencia, que ha estado aquí durante seis semanas y eh, viene con bueno, estos frutos de una colaboración que tenemos con el National Museum of Fine Arts de Taiwán, el Museo de Bellas Artes de, de Taiwán. Y eh, en principio, pues nada, ha estado aquí con un proceso, eh, digamos, como va, que ya va a hablar en inglés. Entonces, os cuento brevemente que simplemente esto es cuestión de es un fermentado, eh, eh, es una bacteria que no me sé el nombre, pero os lo voy a poner después porque la tengo aquí. Es gluconacetobacter, ¿vale? Que no es la bacteria, la lactobacillus ni nada, es esta otra que es, super, <ríe> que es muy, eh, muy saludable también. Y entonces, con lo que se hace con esto es se fermenta junto con eh, té y azúcar y entonces que creamos esta, esta, esta bebida fermentada que es tan sana, pero si lo dejamos luego eh, fermentar más tiempo, pues crea una especie de membrana celular con la que luego puedes eh, construir, pues eso, con hacer mobiliario o hacer eh, textiles y, en fin, que ella lo va a explicar. Y, bueno, pues lo que voy a hacer es, es leer un poco su biografía, ¿vale? Entonces, Rey Yupin... Eh, se formó en el campo de la medicina de rehabilitación en la Facultad de Medicina de la Universidad de Taiwán. De Taiwán. Actualmente es candidata graduada en Arte, Cultura y Programa de Tecnología en el MIT. Con su práctica busca, busca negociar el espacio de deslizamiento dentro del discurso de la suma y la resta, para proponer que el cuerpo y su alteridad siempre han sido uno, trabajando a través de varios medios, incluyendo esculturas cinéticas, vidrio y materiales biológicos, crea prótesis de cosas que se sienten como falta de interfaces íntimas y cuerpos sin órganos, de cortes y tejido conectivo, de lo extranjero y lo familiar. Y bueno, ha expuesto en un montón de museos, tanto en exposiciones individuales como colectivas. Y nada, sin más, os paso el con Rey. Y bueno, si tenéis alguna duda en cuanto a la traducción, pues nos decís, porque aquí todos estamos. Ya sé, ahora esto es inglés, ¿no? Más o menos. <risa> pues es como va a ser, entonces si, si no luego como nos tomamos una cerveza y ya... No, si os queda alguna duda, hablamos. Thank you for that introduction. Um, if during my talk uh, anything is not, not understandable, um, you just raise your hand and I'll repeat it or try to explain it. Um, as Sonia introduced, I'm an artist from Taiwan and my name is Ray. And I'm here on this six-week residency program, a collaboration between Taiwan Museum of Fine Art and Media Lab. And this is the title of my project. Uh, so in the past year, I've been kind of on this journey to come to terms with uh, my own position in relation to nature. Um, I used to be a therapist, as some of you know, and I, I grew up in a family of um, doctors and engineers. So uh, very much with this like scientific frame of mind growing up. Um, and my biology was always my favorite subject. And even now, as I work as an artist, I still work very closely with synthetic biology. But being an artist has um, afforded me the space to kind of stay, uh, take, a stay, take a step back and examine um, how, I'm, how I am engaging with what I'm doing more critically. Um, so, yeah, can you hear me? I, I feel like it just got really loud. No? No. <laughs> so, <laughs> I always thought, I always thought biology was beautiful, and it is. And but it's also very problematic, as as all sciences are. And I feel like it's because science, it although it imposes itself as coming out from nature, it really is a cultural project that um, tries to take nature out of its context in order to um, subject it to our control. And so I wanted to. Um, Create or just think about the possibilities of new ways, new philo philosophies of belonging, and new relationships to this world, world that I dwell in with many others. And so my art trajectory started with the body because of my experiences as a therapist, and it was about how all the ways that the body carried within it its own otherness 
and I engaged with that otherness through um, like analyzing medical phenomena like phantom limb pain or through theories of psychoanalysis or um, child developmental psychology to demonstrate that um, we're not the complete and self-contained individuals that we always thought we were. And with the more recent uh, microbiome research, it goes to show that even more that we are, um, we're not individuals. But the word individual literally means um, indivisible unit. And as it turns out, in all of us, there are millions of microbes that make up, make up who we are. And um, in like cell count, it is 90% more than our own body cells, but they contribute to um, many aspects of us, of our well-being, of who we are, and even in ways that we think about as our self-identity, right? So, like um, how we feel, how we react, how we behave to situations, or um, like what diseases we're susceptible to, what allergies we have, and even the more recent research on love being that um, we choose our mates, our potential mates, because the microbes they carry um, signify an immunological profile that is beneficial to our reproduction. So even in things like love, like who we choose to be with has a, um, has a basis on the non-human. And so it's interesting to think about the implications of that on, on notions like the Cartesian like body-mind duality where intelligence always has to be central and situated in the head. And so the scientists are now calling our guts um, the second brain. So what implications does that have um, if a part of our intelligence is in our guts? And so um, it's kind of a summary of like what I just said, there is like this axis, a direct pathway between the brain and the gut, called the gut-brain axis, and it immediately influences the neurotransmitters in our brains. And so you've probably heard of like butterflies in your stomach or like gut feeling, and that's that we always used to think of that as just a fleeting feeling, but it turns out there is this uh, physiochemical basis for it. And um, so I started to think about the word biotechnology and how it's so um, present in our life nowadays. Everything has to do with biotech. But we have had biotechnology for thousands of years um, through producing alcohol with yeast. And so our ancestors mastered this, this relationship with um, these microorganisms to produce fruitful foods, food products that um, fostered relationships and communities that were more relational. And so I wanted to start this project with um, fermenting kombucha, which is a kind of probiotic drink. So um, uh, most of you probably know probiotics, and uh, because of how influential our uh, gut microbiome is on our personhood, now a lot of companies are um, working on uh, kind of selling products to tend to your microbial garden. So you have to think of the microbiome on and in your bodies more like gardens and very different kinds of gardens, like your oral microbiome, your armpit, your gut. Um, they all have very different makeups. So you have to um, know how to tend to each of them. And a lot of them are selling like products like probiotics probiotic pills, probiotic drinks, or like prebiotics, which is a very new thing they're working on now that contains like good bacteria spores. And, um, and then there are like fecal transplants, which is like, uh, I can't help, I shouldn't, I don't really need to talk about that right now. But um, anyway, so through producing kombucha, um, the bacteria, and yeast that works symbiotically to ferment the liquid produces this layer of, um, it's called a SCOBY, which is bacterial cellulose. And I've been harvesting this material to, um, to work with in my own art practice. And um, so I'm going to like run through the process with a lot of photos. Uh, this is the beginning where this, this material, as you can see, uh, is growing right here. 
it grows into the area of whatever container it is in. So in order to be able to get these uh, large sheets of um, bacteria as a cellulose, I needed um, containers that were like flat and, and large. And so this was the process of um, drilling holes on each of them to create air vents. And this is the brand of kombucha I got. So when I got here, because in America, it's a very, very fashionable drink right now, so you can buy it everywhere. And um, I, I thought it would be the same here, but it turns out it's you can only find this in like organic food stores, and um, and you can only find this brand that works uh, to create to um, contain like microorganisms for you to revive because uh, other. Other companies and flavors, they pasteurize the, the tea so it becomes, most of the bacteria is dead. And so I had to go around all over the grid to find, um, find the, this what I call seed, what you begin creating a scoby with. And so this is me um, brewing the sweet tea, which is its food. It just needs caffeine and sugar and water and pouring into the tanks. And then in order to um, create an environment of um, a warm, uh, humid environment for it, we built this like plastic greenhouse. And then we built a photo booth to create a time-lapse video of it growing. And it's not part of the exhibition today, but it will be playing on the screen later when it's installed permanently. And so um, I applied to here with a very specific proposal. And um, I was offered the opportunity to open it up and ask for collaborators. And so this was the first presentation to them. And um, there was a very vibrant group of individuals, some of which are here today. And some of them were like designers or artists, students, biologists, engineers. And they were all very interested in this material already. So they all came with their their ideas and their own backgrounds and professions. So during the very first meeting, we already came up with this big list of uh, very exciting ideas to deal with kombucha. And I wanted to focus on projects that would like, foster a, a more relational kind of relationship to these organisms. And it can be design objects, but designed in a way that allows people to interact with this material differently and to think about the liveliness of it. And so the first um, is like soft robotics, which is uh, the, the three inflated objects in the back. So there's a field of robots now uh, called soft robots and they're, um, they're famous for the ability to, for example, go into spaces that, like, that hard robots can't get into or be able to uh, deflate and inflate. Um, but no one has tried to do it with a biomaterial before. It's always done with silicon. So I thought that was a very, um, very interesting proposal. And there was a furniture student who wanted to try making fiber out of kombucha and to knit it like a, a yarn or to weave it into a basket and to make furniture with it. And then there was a big part of the discussion about food, about new possibilities of food and packaging. Because this material, you can dry it into a crisp. It could be like, it could um, instead of paper plates, it could be kombucha plates, which was also like the wrapper for the food. Uh, so we called it like microbial gastronomy. And then we wanted to make a book which recorded all of the recipes for these food, the new types of dishes and cuisine. And the book part uh, got manifested in that light box, which is. It became more of a, a memory collection of this very process. And then there were some ideas about like video or sound work and making like stained glass window with this material. So proposing a new type of architectural material and experimenting with dyeing it with natural dyes in different ways. And then um, a week later, the second meeting, we had some demos and then we um, we brainstormed a little bit more and kind of focused on a few projects to create more of a group narrative. And began drawing on the windows, um, patterning, designing the, the objects we talked about. 
and we also ex tried some imaging with um, with the DIY microscopes that Hamilton made with his biophilia group. And we are always surrounded by visitors, curious about what we're doing, working with a strange material. And then this is just our schedule. Because this is an um, exceptionally short workshop, usually you have a bit more time to plan and to get to know each other and to formulate new ideas. But since it was only two weeks and working with a material that is alive um, means that there are a lot of things that are very out of your control. For example, the, the time it took to grow here was a lot more than I anticipated and was much longer than my experience of growing a brewing kombucha. And so everything had to be very, very intense and shortened the amount of time. And so this was the first time we harvested when we decided, okay, we can't wait for it to grow anymore. And so this piece was still kind of uh, thin and relatively thin. And the process is we spread it out on wax paper to prevent it from um, adhering to the surface when it dries. And we kind of spread out the sheets and just let it dry overnight. So because Madrid is so dry, it's, uh, this process was faster than I anticipated. And then we, I'll go um, project by project. So there are um, the soft robotics where we made patterns. So it's kind of like making clothes. And you um, create patterns to, to cut the material out with. And some of it was uh, filled, filled with this wax paper to prevent adhesion so it could become an inflated balloon. And so we were designing this a soft robot that moved with lungs that inflated and deflated at different times to create movement. And so these were the three organs, lungs for the inflatable. And then, so when it dries, uh, we inflated it into these bladders, connected to tubes. And then the last step was adding another layer of kombucha to create a skin-like texture over it. So it, the skin also expands and deflates with the, with the whole robot. And there's another inflatable, which um, is one kind of like a fish with uh, scales that moves when the object was inflated. And by the same process, it's also creating patterns and inlaying wax paper. And this was the, um, how it looked right before drying. And so we created these individual pieces of scales, um, each underlaid with wax paper so that they could be removed and they could all move freely. And this is a video of it um, moving in, the, in a more natural way. So like because of the pressure distribution, the scales on different areas are expanding at different rates, so it creates like a very, um, very natural breeding movement. And um, this is just an anecdote. So of all of our trays, we had 25 trays growing. Most of them were growing slower than I thought, and they were very thin, and then out of nowhere, there was this one guy that was very thick and very bumpy, which is something I've, I've never encountered with all of my experience of growing kombucha. And they created these, uh, and they look like um, the ocean at night under the moonlight. This is um, the harvesting of it. And so this became this inflatable in front, and you could, when it, you look at it through the light, you could still see the bumps that were the ripples of the ocean. And the third project is this, which is um, moving fish scales. So uh, Hugo, a fashion designer, wanted to make a dress with these scales that moved. So we decided to begin with something more manageable and created kind of a sample for it. So um, this was when I we experimented with laser cutting and laser engraving on kombucha, which is also something I haven't tried. And the effects are, are very ephemeral, so you, you can't really see it um, against, you have to see, look at it against the light to see it. 
And this is a laser engraved portrait of Goya on kombucha. So um, upon realizing that this process works, um, we created the next project. Uh, but so this this project it's um, fish scales that are automated with with servo motors. And um, so following the laser engraving, we wanted to create the book that we talked about earlier out of the same um, technique. And um, we made this kind of book of memory diary or archive of the, the process of us, of like this group of humans thinking about this microbial community and how to best design with them. And so this was the results of the books and you can see very faintly there are some, some text when, you, when it's against that light. Yeah, so this process has been very valuable to me because I have never worked with other people in a collaboration before. I've always done my works alone. And opening it up um, was a bit uncertain at first, but I think because of the group of individuals that we had, they were all very keen-minded and very enthusiastic, and I was very um, moved by, by their enthusiasm. So. Um, instead of doing the projects I set out to do, I um, did this instead. And I, I think you can see that, like, that we had a lot of fun and it really was a great experience for me. And I want to thank all my collaborators and also Hamilton, my technical mentor, collaborator. Yeah. <laughs> and if you'd like to say a few words. Yesterday you said you might. <laughs> okay, Okay, thank you so much, and if you have any questions, just let me know. The question is that you, she, she, she thinks that we have had uh, problems with the sugar and then if you think you should change something about the sugar in the process, maybe put it more or less. To find an alternative material you mean? No, no, not an alternative. Like we have problems maybe because there was... Uh, oh, because of the sugar. Too much, too much yes, sugar, no? uh, that was a part, uh, a problem because um, with this with this bacteria, it metabolizes sugar. So you, the more sugar you give it, the faster it grows. And because of the my short amount of residency time, I had to add double the sugar I usually did. And it created um, these sheets that were extremely um, sticky to the touch. But um, we've realized that just by washing it right after you harvest it, just putting it in a, uh, a bowl of water and letting the sugar wash off helps a lot. Um, because with creating inflatables, it creates a problem where they, the two layers don't adhere as well because the sugar is preventing it. And so I think washing it off would be the solution and also just to um, stick to the normal amount of sugar. Right. And, oh, okay. Right, I mean, translate to her, maybe you understand. So the thing is that, uh, que la cosa fue como que, ¿las entendido? Vale, pero has entendido todo, que fue una cuestión como la kombucha no tenía muchos cubos y entonces tuvimos que poner más azúcar, al poner más azúcar se vuelve todo muy pegajoso y claro, luego cuando lo quieres, pues se, se pega, como nos ha ocurrido que hay como que se pegan las, eh, es más, eh, más fácil que, que no sea una estructura, o sea, pero lo que se solucionó es lavándolo, es lo que ha dicho, lavándolo, se, más o menos se ha mejorado. Ah, ok. Si, si, si tuviese el mismo problema. Ah. Ok, si you had the same problem, would you use again the, the extra sugar or you do it differently? I think to do it again, I would have began with the SCOBY itself. So, um, one thing I forgot to mention is part of the exhibition on the left corner, there are these little bottles filled with seeds that um, we 
cultivated during this time. And there's a little uh, like recipe manual in front of it showing you how to make your own, and you can take it if you want, if you're interested, it's free. And so on it, it explains that there are three steps. And the first step is to create a SCOBY, which takes about a month. And um, the second and third steps are much faster. And if I could do it again, accounting for the time, I would have started with the SCOBY. So you can buy SCOBYs directly online, or you can, there are these communities that um, grow their own kombucha that exchange as SCOBYs. I would have done that. So that would have saved me at least two to three weeks. Yeah. And then I, I would have a normal amount of sugar. Um, yeah, so the, the little bottles th that are um, free for distribution was part of the original proposal because of this idea of this project really being this um, opportunity to create a space in the community to talk about this and to kind of just hang out over a drink, but also to like dispense the knowledge and to um, find vehicles in you, these human vehicles to propagate the the bacterial community in your bodies. And, but the rest were all result, direct results from the open collaboration. Uh, and what I really liked about them is that they're, they're, they all have this idea of agency. So like this piece is very obvious when you think of agency. One of the first like main signifiers is movement. So when something moves, you attribute a kind of personhood to it. So like this movement, and then the the soft robots having this um, very human like breathing, like inhaling and exhaling behavior is also like conductive to that empathy. And the book being a kind of archive relating to to memory and the idea of um, bacterial memory, which exists and we're just learning about it. And what does that um, what does that do to our notion of um, of memory and of agency. Yeah, so I, I really like these projects. Um, Habéis entendido que esto es para que os lo llevéis, que este es el líquido de no es, no es el Scooby que es aquello, pero con esto fermentándolo durante un mes tenéis el Scooby. Y aquí están las instrucciones, le pedí que ya, pues claro, hiciéramos un poco que, que nos, nos hiciera un poco la explicación de cómo generar tu propia bebida, tu propio té de kombucha. Vale, entonces, la primera parte es cómo fermentar eso y luego ya es eh, cómo hacer el té de kombucha. Así que podéis cogerlo luego. ¿Alguna preguntita más? Muy bien, pues nada, muchísimas gracias, Rey.